So do you still need the presentation? This one? Okay. <laughs> um, but if you also can make sure that it's compatible with uh, OSX, you can do those one or something like that. No? So it just is Thank you. 
Sí, se ve. Se ve. No, pero el speaker va a estar ahí. Eso pasa en medio de todo. Se tiene que poder ver la presentación. Ah, but you can have the both of them on. At the you same can, time. yeah. I just have yeah. to power this down. Great, that would yeah. be awesome. Okay, I can do it. Yeah. Then you don't have that whole thing. Yeah. Okay. I just gotta power this down, switch it out, and then we'll power it back up. I, I, That was the only thing I was saying is once that completely powers down, then I can unplug it and replug it. Sure. Okay. Yeah, no problem. That's what we're here for. Just let us know what, what we can help with. And we'll, we'll help you guys. What's your name? Jose. Jose, I'm Mike. Nice to meet you.
Okay, here we go. Um, my name is uh, Michael Stockport. I'm the Danish research associate in the US. So I'll do this very short. Um, but firstly, welcome to the fourth annual economics conference. Uh, we've been voting for now, two at the Berkeley and two at Stanford. Um, first, I'd like to say uh, and convey my deepest thanks and regrets also from the Danish Minister of Trade and Investments. The investment is Pio Studio. Just been here in the last two days, and she was supposed to open this conference, uh, but now you have to do the means that she had to, to, to attend some important talks in Denmark, so she had to leave the day over. So sorry for that, but she really would like to be here. But the good thing about this is now she knows what the science is, and she also knows how big stronghold it is with Denmark. So the reason why the Danish government actually goes to sponsor this uh, for the fourth time in a row, and we will continue doing it, is of course that we are so strong. And uh, it's also that you can see that these conferences, they, uh, they contribute to a great network with our American counterparts. But also, uh, from this conference, I can see the expansion, not just in, in, in people from around the world, but also in research areas, and I'm very glad about that. But you will hear uh, all about that in the next two, in the next two days. So uh, just briefly about the program, it's uh, very packed, it's very tight. So uh, if you can, I know it's hard, but please stay within the time minutes. Uh, we also have a few breaks during the day. We have a talk break at around 11 in lunch, and then we have a closed session uh, with the binary session uh, in the afternoon. Uh, just a few practical information. Uh, bathrooms are up here to the right. Uh, wi Fi is a Stanford guest. Uh, if that, that doesn't succeed for you, uh, please come to me and have a, a password for you guys. If, uh, for those of you who uh, didn't upload the presentations yet, please uh, give uh, presentations to ask up over here, my system, and he will make sure that everything happens. That's it from me and the Danish government, but you're uh, very welcome. And I would like to announce the next guest here, which is uh, Mr. Olaf Zuko, Professor at Stanford for Times. He will give you a brief overview of the, 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 the highlights and the passages of Stanford. And also maybe a bit about the professional team at Stanford and ETU Denmark. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. It's, it's a great pleasure for me to be here and, and to welcome you all to this uh, uh, workshop uh, uh, by the Innovation Center of Denmark. Um, where, you know, I've, I've been to one of these before. I haven't been to the ones up in Berkeley, but I've been here. And then the last time it was really great. And what is the purpose of sort of reading conference and workshop like this? Is to try to try and make, make new connections and new research collaborations and so forth. So that's what I've spent my 10 minutes on this. We can send you what's going on at Stanford. It's very much a connection about it. It's very superficially. And if it just, if you try to sort of get your cars to uh, go and seek out some of the people here and try to make those connections and that can be for the research collaborations in the future. Uh, so much of the research uh, uh, in photonics or sample is actually centered. Uh, this is centered here in the Ginston Avenue. This is the Spilter building now, and the Ginston Avenue is housed in the Spilter building. Um, and um, when I say centered, that really means just sort of that much of it is going on outside too. There, there happen to be about the, uh, almost 20 uh, the, uh, Professors working on photonics in this building, but there's another 40 or something like that that are at least doing photon related research at other parts of the campus. So, this is just a small part of it um, uh, what's going on at Stanford. There we go. So, um, much of it is organized through the Stanford uh, Photonics Research Center, and here are some of the things that we've worked on. So, it's, not, it's a wide range of uh, 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 the areas that you are uh, um, that you are focusing on will be in the center of the research center from the information technology, quantum information science, fiber optics, uh, integrated photonics, microscopy, neuroscience, uh, and sort of uh, applications to biophotonics, if you like, or things that are growing very rapidly in the for fundamental and photonics research and fundamental optical interactions. Those are the 
or sort of the, the spawn things that we're doing. And I'm just going to give you a sort of a snapshot of a very, very few cases. I'm not selected in any particular order, just to give you a little bit of a, a, a feel for what's going on. And the point, like I'm saying, is that we need to get excited about that. We need to seek the CPP cloud and go and start collaboration. So I'm starting out with uh, one of our young professors in the Gibson Laboratory. His name is Ben Ben is Ben. Um, and he uh, is working on uh, the fundamental interact interactions. His favorite uh, item is uh, this Prosporia, which I didn't know anything about until I started talking about it. And it's really sort of here, uh, research on the, on the science forefront, the use in research uh, to get advantage. So it's a national science interact. And uh, another one is uh, more towards optical autonomous applications is David Miller is working on optical interconnects. I think it's a lot of this whole research group carries from their both piece of work and you can see how important that I'm working on the people and finding that I'm trying to just to remind you of. He's working on optical interconnects, the domain of modulator is one of those things that he's developing. Um, here's a uh, Quite a different piece of work from uh, Yoshi Yamamoto. He's interested in uh, uh, quantum information science and has uh, one of his description uh, um, uh, 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 experiments on uh, quantum networks. Um, uh, there you go. Uh, another one is working in uh, quantum information science is Jelena uh, Lukovich, which she actually did work very closely with Yoshi still to do that. Postdoc, now she's a professor. Um, and here are some of the work that she's doing. This is a uh, single mode LED, very, very good sort of LED, no longer LED, but she's doing the sort of work on the single photon that also. But she's also interested in applications, so it's a lot of work. Yeah, 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 so so, um, so then, uh, and, yeah, and so that's actually a very, very quick overview. And then I want to sort of say a few things about I only said the most of them to go into the whole range, but just say one very typical thing uh, that has happened over the last few years in my career. We, we, we work on what we get with the max and, and my crosswalk and so forth. It's not clear really how that relates to accelerators, which is what I have here. But this was uh, something that came out of this sort of some conversations that I had with Bob Iyer. Bob Iyer is a Black laser pioneer, and he had the interest in using the strong laser fields. I mean, know, should in theory be very useful for electron uh, acceleration uh, for the long term. This is a problem. Uh, and he was sort of like combining uh, his knowledge about lasers and accelerators with our understanding of the microcommunication to be quite very good. So, this is something that I'm very excited about doing the first year in the right now. Hopefully, have your soul to the next. Actually, even maybe what possibly needs to do is imagine myself like Slack right now with our first fabricated uh, electron accelerator. We still have to close our fingers to see if that works. Sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, um, but this is sort of an example of the type of interactions that happen in Stanford. It's just Bob and me being in the same building, working on very different problems, and getting together and working on how we do it and share our questions. And that's what I love to do. I'm inviting you all to come home to the Institute of the SDRC and go to the research trips. Yeah. As much as I love my colleagues and staff in general, it really makes this big place that what it is are the students. They're, they are really in the life of And I'm happy to say that uh, among those students, optics students are the best. Uh, and I'm saying that because it's a super, completely subjective to the person. And because of my students, the students are my colleagues. But they are. The ones that are actually running some of the most exciting and, uh, and uh, interesting uh, student organizations on campus. So, the Sanford Platonic Optical Society, uh, which is a student run uh, group, is putting together some of the most uh, uh, interesting um, conferences and so forth uh, in office, uh, on office at Sanford. Uh, they, they do a lot of networking and collaboration, that is what they're uh, what they get for so to speak, and they are a good thing that strong contribution to that collaboration. Um, they put on an alliance, uh, an international conference.
apartments are reality in my business and all over the world. This is true that we have apartments. So, but the one that I really like the most, and you know, I like many of you, I go to conferences all over the world and yeah, uh, the, the one that I like the most is right here in our own backyard, and, and that's uh, Stanford University of Science Research. The retreat, and that's something that's put on by the students. So this is a student run organization, and you're always surprised me every year. It's always in a new location, it's always close, and it's always one of the most fun events of the year. So I'm looking forward to this one uh, happening in a couple of months uh, right here, and in our backyard, that's the one that's close to mine. Um, so um, with that, I want to sort of finish up with just uh, saying to you that the whole Inviting you to go and visit our web pages, but also visit uh, more efficiently uh, over in the Gitz Laboratory. Talk to the students, talk to the, the, the researchers over there, talk to the faculty, uh, because we're all really in that mode of doing collaborative research. Uh, that's really what it's about, and that's why I'm excited about being here today. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, with that, I'd like to welcome you again. Thank you very much. Good morning. It is my pleasure on behalf of the Seneca University of Denmark to welcome you. It is also a pleasure to see again our friends here in the Bay Area for this economics and also to welcome our new friends. So my name is Peter Fonsetta Fulmuroy and on behalf of my colleagues I would like to introduce you globally. It's a global overview of what we do in economics back in the Seneca University of Denmark. So a little bit of where we come from. So we are located in the Copenhagen area. Our campus is just a few minutes north of Copenhagen city. Uh, the history of the Technical University of Denmark dates back to 1829. It was founded by Hans Christian Erskut, one of the, the pioneers in putting the foundation for the theory of electromagnetism. And it was inspired by the Ecole Polytechnique in France, so we founded an engineering school college in Denmark. So that's how can we trace back our history. So today we are the leading university in engineering. So the Technical University of Denmark is basically engineering and we call good rankings in, in, in Europe. And the Department of Photonics is just one of the several departments of the university. So we are a photonics engineering department founded in January 28. When we gather research and education and innovation in photonics in one place, and this is what we are at the, the Department of Photonics in the Technical University of Denmark. So we are around 20, uh, 220, 220, 220 persons. <coughs> Most of them are scientific staff and PhD students, and we are organized in clusters divided by thematic topics. So those are nanophotonics and communication technology, which I belong to, light sources and industrial sensors, and dynamic economics. And uh, it is a pleasure for me to say that uh, today and tomorrow, you will hear uh, speaker colleagues that represent all of these topics here in this workshop. So a little bit on, on, on what is done, very global, but as I said, uh, we have representatives from all of these clusters and groups here in this workshop today and tomorrow. So, in the area of communications technology, which is what I belong to, so we have four groups. And in this case, uh, there's going to be a speaker for each of those groups here in this workshop. So the opportunity to hear more details. So I will start by colleagues um, in the group of coding displays and video. Um, this other group I would like to mention is the networking experimental platform. Uh, is also here in this workshop. And then there is a group on high-speed um, technologies, like the 
short course generation, detection, and transmission for optical time division of detective systems, and also investigations into amplification based on parametric effects. And then is the group I am leader of that we take uh, research regarding meta access, short database, and digital signal processing, and we look at the convergence of these topics. Then is the group on nanotonics, and we are also going to have two talks in, in this workshop uh, by Dr. Chun and uh, Dr. Chris Ely on their work, they regarding semiconductors. This also work on even for smart integration. This one of the strong works have been for many years with you. And also uh, uh, new areas of mathematical materials and uh, quantum dots, and also uh, groups working on the theory of, of materials and new devices. So the next uh, cluster is the light sources and illusion sensors, and there is also one talk here uh, in this workshop uh, regarding application of photonics to lead us. But in that group, there is also work going on on LEDs and process interfaces. And I would just encourage you to, to attend the presentation representing this cluster. The other activity, also represented here uh, by two speakers, uh, is the dynamic photonics and biophotonics. So more in the session, touching up on biophotonics, organized by Dr. Gustav. And in this group, uh, there is also activities concerning terahertz technology and its applications. And we also have to talk by Dr. Peter Jackson. So the group opportunities to hear more about this. Activities uh, which are very exciting is the developments in optical pieces. And I'm very happy to say that Dr. Gustav will be here and be able to talk more about that. So I wanted to give you a global overview of the topics and well, uh, that we have. And once again, I would like to reinforce the, the statement of Professor Solgar. So we are here to get to know each other, to get to know what we're doing, and find common topics for possible cooperations, and also to inspire our students to enter into the basic topic of performance, which is a very exciting one. So with this, I just would like uh, welcome you again and uh, move into the program today. It's a very exciting one. So I think that with this, I will change hat and will become the chair of the first session of today. <coughs> so I would like to pick up the first session of today uh, with a small change between the start between. Of Professor Chang and Dr. Yuen. So um, we will have the pleasure to introduce Professor Vincent Chang from MIT. I'd like to thank Julie for willing to swap with me because uh, I have to catch a flight at 10 55 at SFO. So, I also decided to talk using a new topic instead of the one in the program because I gave a talk in Stanford just two years ago on the same subject. And actually, one of Professor Kowski's uh, group is actually working with me, so you'll hear from that too. So, this is actually, uh, I like this topic uh, because it's a lot of fun. Uh, the question is can we use uh, atmospheric turbulence? Atmospheric turbulence is terrible. Idea. Three series of communication breaks it up that scintillation and all that. The question is, can I can I actually make use of it? That's why the title said, can I do it using mirage and mirages? Look like one well, of these things. And is it really true or smoke and mirror? So you decide after I give my talk. Okay? And it's networking. So the application is mostly in a uh, urban environment where you have rooftop to rooftop communication in free space and about three kilometer in diameter, it can be ten, doesn't matter. Or even within a single data center where the atmosphere is uh, actually due to air conditioning and turbulence has pretty much the same effect. So I'm going to talk about how instead of being hurt by the turbulence, I'll play the turbulence to my advantage. So here is the, the fun part. Uh, I don't know why we want to 
community between this Jeep and my car, and yet another car, uh, I want to use the same frequency and also use uh, uh, two different spatial regions, and I face my transmitter in such a way to do it right. The biggest problem that we encounter is during the channel, there are turbines that one part in the moon change in refractive index, and they act at weak lenses. So in the receiving plane, instead of a nice round mode as a vacuum, we have breakouts. We have a hot spot and cold spot. And this moves around as the turbulence is being blown across the path by velocity, wind velocity, the perpendicular. And that's the time scale that the turbulence change that these things are dancing around. So you may have a very good signal at one second, and all of a sudden, within a tenth of a second, you have a 20 dB drawback. And if you are communicating at a very high speed, like we're thinking 100 dB per second, we lose a whole lot of data, many, many packets. So that's actually very bad for internet protocol, and there's no solution at this point yet. So what happened is, if you consider a very crude model of the channel, that it is on most of the time, and then all of a sudden, when the power flow below some level, the error correcting code will be corrected, and then we will call that an outage. So it's crudely is a non is a markup process with two states: a non-outage stage and an outage stage. And here's some experimental data for all practical purposes. They're very close to the markup process. In fact, if you do all the mathematics using theory of common dark spectrum and all these kind of uh, uh, turbulence theory, you'll actually find that the correlation function is t, this little time t to the power of five third in theory. And if it is Markov, it's only t to the power of one, not five thirds, it's three over three. And lo and behold, when you measure the data, it's actually closer to this and this. So the reason is that those theory that you know in Turbulence theory, they're just approximation. So my design doesn't depend finally on the shape of the curve. And here's how it works. We assume we have an array transmitter and array receiver going through the turbulence, and I can manipulate the amplitude phase of each one of these aperture will. Most of the time, you see diversity receiver and transmitter. This is assuming that if the receiver any one of these apertures in one of these deep now, if I have enough of these apertures spatially distributed over coherence length of the uh, turbulence, I would have at least one aperture with some energy. That's how I'll connect it. That, that's what people usually do. But I'm going to do more than that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use coherent measurement at each one of the receiver signal process, the amplitude phase. Actually, there's some digital signal going on. Uh, I'll talk about that later. And then send the receiver information and feedback to the transmitter. This is new. It's a low rate channel. It turns out it's about 80 bit per mode of the field uh, for the time scale of turbulence. And I would then pre distort the amplitude phase of the transmitter array. And for that reason, I want to show that I can make use of this turbulence actually instead of being put. So the question is, can it be done? So basically, I want to use the uh, turbulence in the middle of the channel as a relay lens and really, uh, uh, really a uh, mirage in, in that sense. So let me paragraph the uh, result of first. This is diversity. That means the number of aperture. And this is from the performance gain. These two curves in color uh, are the receiver gain when you have diversity of receiver? This is like 100 little aperture. Uh, you can actually have already 20 dB or so of uh, gain. But if you use feedback, you realize another 15 dB of gain. That's a lot of gain. Okay, the reason is that those dropouts are like 20, 30 dB dropouts. And I wouldn't have to use it, but we don't have dropouts from the So what am I doing? It turns out mathematically, uh, here's as mathematical as it gets in this talk. Uh, we can assume that the turbulent channel to be one with a random transfer function h. The input is x, the x is the vector input of all the little actual rate of amplitude phase. The output y is related to the 
but input x to a transformation h, which is a random matrix with a, some noise factor. It turns out, unfortunately, for a long while, this, this matrix is not what is called permutation or self joint and doesn't lend itself to very good analysis. Um, there are some recent theory in random matrices and, and also deterministic matrices where you can actually factor this matrix into a diagonal form with an orthogonal matrix in the front and an orthogonal matrix in the rear, except they're not the same one. They are made up of orthogonal vector, but they're not the same. So the input vector B, U, the output vector. Uh, the input vector is B, the output vector is U. So what happened is, if you look at the distribution of the eigenvalue of this diagonal matrix, um, for high enough turbulence, you suddenly, for example, on this one, okay, you'll find that the eigenvalue is not one. If the transfer function doesn't have any gain like this vacuum and normalize it to one. Now, the mathematics tells me, which is puzzling, that I can have an eigenvalue bigger than one, let's say 10. Okay? What is that telling me? What is that? That tells me if I excite that eigen mode, my transfer of energy is more than that of the transfer of a vacuum. That sounds too good to be true, right? That's the mirage. And if you just finish calculating, I explain the number more. If you calculate the performance gain as a function of number of transmitter aperture, you will find using feedback you can actually take about 10 to 20 dB additional gain over conventional diversity, which is amazing. What really is going on, the next two people I'll explain, then I'll conclude, is that you look at the eigenvalue, uh, if it is in vacuum, all the eigenvalue are unity. Normalized unity is like a circle in a hyper hyper sphere. If you have turbulence, the, the sphere is distorted into an ellipsoid of n dimension. And what I'm doing is I find the major, the biggest axis of that ellipsoid. And I excite that node. And I receive that node at the receiver. And that will be bigger than one. And that's where the sector like 10 gain comes from. Now it turns out as the turbulence move, this ellipsoid to first order is rotating slowly. So in terms of feeding back, I don't have to feed back the whole state. I don't have to feed back the rotation of the angle and the change of the length of the axis. Until it abruptly gets below the another axis, I have to switch over, which is what this is all about. I have actually another vector ready, and when the Major, the largest axis get below the other one, I switch to the other one. Now you can think about that that can be disrupted to network protocol, and it does. Okay? Uh, in any case, if I take the maximum eigenvalue, I should be able to get uh, the best possible transfer. So here is what's going on. And you know, you scratch your head, so why is this the case? What happened is that if you have a vacuum channel between the transfer and the receiver, that's sort of Vacuum attenuation is diffraction limited uh, things. But if you have turbulence all throughout in between, each one of these small turbulence, if you face the input right, can be used as some kind of relay lens or converging lens. Okay? And you only can do this if you have feedback. So what is happening is I'm exciting a mode so that I'm exciting this mirage. There's actually probably some scene underneath the horizon. It's actually called ducting mode in, in HF terms. Okay? So that is actually what I'm doing. And we roll and code, um, we actually know of verifying the statistics, and this actually does work. And we're building an experiment and looking at probably the future. So here's my conclusion, okay, of my talk. Uh, it turns out, in order to make this system work, I have to work on the physical layer to the media access control to the routing and the transport layer. Everything has to be changed. Because of the nature of this photonic particles, I take the physical layer of propagation to talk about, and not about the transport and the routing layer. And the routing layer has to deal with the fact that I would switch sometimes to another eigenvector. During that switch, that may be a temporary disruption. 
and I have to be tested with those packets. So actually, I'm coupling tested layer protocol when there's a disruption, and actually have every route that has some memory. And when they switch route or switch icon back to the transmitter, I do have to reset some packets. So it's a sort of new set of protocol for network and control system. So uh, I would say all the tricks another day is a totally new thing for the networking world. It'd be very interesting, but I don't want to talk about it right now. So I'll end here. Thank you very much. So uh, let's take one or a couple of questions. Yes, please. Why is it on the feedback channel? Yes. It's angry on the I assume the China doesn't have any error. I can use, uh, I'm glad you asked that question, I can actually use a return <coughs> of the link uh, for the channel. In that case, I have to take into account that the return of the channel may have played in and guess it gets complicated. The map I use assume is the low rate. It's 80 bit per second per mode. So if you have 100 modes, it's 80 times 100 bit per second. So 80, 80 a little bit, something like that. It's very low rate, so you can use the phone line or ether. Just a question about this feedback channel also. Am I right that the interesting thing about this is that the rate you need on the feedback channel is dependent on turbulence? On the, the speed bit speed. rate you put through the main channel can yeah. be as high as you like. Well, the, the stuff I put through the chain, main channel is extremely high rate. And, and the feedback doesn't even have to be obvious. Yeah. And actually, we proved that the feedback we use is actually <laughs> based on channel capacity. <laughs> and it has to do with rate distortion theory and things like that. But we can talk about that offline. Off yes. So the feedback channel is what you rely on. How would it be possible to do that? If you could get a rate like a research, you can see, say, Right. You still need some, some information about what you're getting in the wire and I just don't get some feedback channels that are necessary to bring that. The feedback channel is necessary. Yeah. Uh, in some cases, you can take the uh, laser and go back the other way and sort of like by reciprocity, you can actually do something. As I said, you have to deal with sometimes as a dropout and you have to worry about that. And actually, that's being worked on that paper is coming. And it's actually pretty good because the dropout is only 1% at most. Absolutely. In fact, in real life, you do. It's easier to think about it using an off channel or like a telephone line. Okay, that's another one. Yes, sir. Um, we get a lot of people that have to get single to single They have both that have problems. Two different paths? Yes. Um, it, it actually, the, the turbulence actually is whatever the beam divergence it is. And sometimes they actually, some of the light comes through one path and some comes through another path. And I suppress in my talk that actually you keep track of the other path also. And when that other path actually increases the above this current path, I switch to the other path. Yeah, we've got absolutely right. There's actually another path that comes through. And I would excite that path. Right. Oh, scattering. I don't. Scattering, we're talking about millions, and I'm not sure I can measure the amplitude in the base of a million. Yeah, we're seeing it happen so fast now. We have been thinking about that for underwater channel, and that's a totally open problem. You're absolutely going the right direction. I think a hundred thousand we can still manage, and million is a little too much. Okay, but to be determined, I may be wrong. Okay, let's ask Professor Chan with this interesting talk. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. So now it is uh, a pleasure and a pleasure to invite our next invited speaker, uh, Dr. Du Yen, Vice President of Kirisan.
Okay, well, good morning. Nice to see you this morning. I'm Julie Ng. Um, I'm really sorry. Thank you for having me. thought I'd start off by just giving you an overview of some of the work we're doing in industry for um, high bandwidth density transceivers, uh, specifically for the DATCOM uh, side of the market. I uh, just start off with one slide on Finisar for those of you who might or might not be familiar with Finisar. We actually are the now the largest um, fiber optic component supplier in the world. Uh, up here on the right is, uh, is an industry um, assessment of uh, uh, market share. You can see it's still a very fragmented industry. But what surprises most people is that now we're about 50% bigger than the GBS. We're about a billion dollar company, startup company, 25 years old, now on public. About 9,000 employees. So I'll show you the inside. This is the inside of probably an 8 or 10 gig shortwave multi mode transceiver uh, that we ship many millions of per year. And the functionality of this part obviously is taking laser light out down the fiber uh, for tele telecommunication, data communication, receiving light back in. So you have optic chips, optical packaging, and integrated circuits inside this part. And um, what I'm going to talk to you about is how do we go about an industry making these parts faster, smaller, and lower power. Uh, so the industry volume is about 30 million transceivers shipped per year. At uh, Finisar, we ship about a third of that. Um, so we ship a transceiver about every two and a half seconds. And that's equivalent up to about 120 to 240 terabits of bandwidth per day. So you would think that would be enough. But as we all know, the growth of the internet and lots of all communications is not enough. So what people want is higher bandwidth density. And so what this chart shows is um, how bandwidth density has changed essentially over time. So the red curve is bandwidth density. First thing you see is this is in gigabits per second per centimeter cube. And the first thing you see is I have to fly on a log scale, actually. So it's, it's, it, it, that, that densities have increased dramatically, you know, almost a thousand X over this. These are form factors in the industry for about the past 10 years. And over the same period of time, power consumption, specifically if you use a metric called picojoules per bit, has gone down about 100x over the same point in time. What you see is that this side of the chart, a lot of the things here actually are parallel optics. So I'm going to talk first about parallel optics and how that's increasing bandwidth density for short reach communications. And so uh, many of you might be familiar with parallel optics, but for anybody who isn't, what I'm talking about here is multiple, in this case, multi-mode um, shortwave missiles, an array uh, that would be driven by a multi-mode, I mean, a multi-channel multi driver, uh, an array of pin receivers with an array of um, amplifiers. Then that would go into an array of lenses, which would go into many uh, multi-mode parallel ribbon fiber, essentially. Um, and so this has been around for a long time. People have worked on it for a long time, but it's a very niche market, very bursty market, just used for high-speed computing. But what we saw was that as data rates go up in the data center, up to 40 gigabit, 100 gigabits, it's actually the lowest cost way to get a whole bunch of data from one side of the data center to the other. So call it 100 meters, 300 meters. And so that's why I say what you see now is parallel optics really truly moving into the industry. Um, there's established form factors now for 40 gigabits per second is a QSFP, has four lanes of 10 gigabit pixels, um, and 100 gigabits um, for, or up to actually 150, up to 12 by 12. So this form factor is about this big. So you can get 100 gigabits in a form factor this big. Um, you really need to go 100 meters or 300 meters. And the interesting thing is we still sell transceivers this big that are only 1 gigabit. Um, and so what you see also, a, 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 a trend that you see is most of these transceivers I didn't mention, but we plug into the front of, say, a switch or round box. So the aggregate bandwidth density of that box is determined by, you know, how many transceivers that can fit inside the box and what the data rate of each of those transceivers are. So if you want to look to increase the bandwidth density of that switch or router, you have a couple of choices. You can make every transceiver go faster or you can shrink their size and put more of them in the box. Um, one of the trends that people are starting to do is actually put that transceiver inside the box. Because then all they have to route at the front end is, is just a, uh, an optical connector, which is smaller than this K2 mechanical plug-in system. So at Finisar, we call these optical engines or uh, BOAs. There are many names for that uh, in the industry. But what you see here, actually, again, this is a, about an inch square. Uh, this color you see here is a plastic optical array lens. 
Underneath that lens, you'll have um, an array of pixels, which can go up as high as 16 channels. I can actually go up to 25 gigabits per channel. So eventually, we will be able to get 400 gigabits per second, again, for 100 meters in a form factor of about an inch square. Uh, under here, also, you have an array of pins, uh, photos, I'm sorry, uh, amplifiers, and laser drivers. But the interesting thing about this is what you see is that the bandwidth density is not limited by the size of the chip. So people who show you small chips and say, I can build a small thing around that, that's not really uh, taking into account the whole picture. What's limited actually is by the electrical IOs and the high speed pins and the, band and the density of that that our customers can handle at any reasonable board cost on their part. Okay? And secondarily also, this is the optical fiber that then plugs into that. Actually, this fiber is starting to limit the width of the device. And then finally, if you look, this is the heat sink. So actually, dissipating the power is starting to limit the bound density of the part. So a part like this, as I said, right now we are actually shipping that at um, call it 10 by 10, so 100 gig. In development, we have up to 16 channels and 25 gig, so 400 gig. Uh, so we're starting to get to very dense uh, um, transmission capabilities then for short range. And so how would this be used? This is a demo we shared with OFC last year of a true optical backplane. We did it with uh, Zyrotex, uh, Hoover Sooner, and Vario Optics. And right in here, there's a Zyrotex switch chip. And then what you see is each of these little boxes is actually one of those little optical engines. So each of these are 100 feet capable. So this is a one terabit backplane. In this particular case, we took some of the optics out of our fibers. But we actually also do polymer waveguide work um, with very optics inside of the, um, the PCB. So the light would inject down into the PCB, actually travel through the uh, PCB into a blind rate um, optical backlink connector. And we would show together a terabit per second um, operating now. So you can see you start to achieve very, very high uh, bandwidth densities using this technology. And it's, it's you know, one of the less expensive technologies to implement. So what do you have to do next? So the next thing that you increase bandwidth density you need to do is increase the speed of those pixels. And that's really not an easy problem. In fact, in the industry, there was some debate over whether that's just even possible. Uh, but I think most of the industry has now agreed that it's possible to make a reliable 25G pixel laser. And we at Finstar uh, believe that, and we are working on that. Uh, the issue is to make the higher speed, we actually reduce the size of the cavity, which makes uh, the volume difficult. Um, in addition, so this is a 25 GI that we showed at OFC of last year. It's a room temperature and uh, you know, not worst case, but uh, you can see you can make the part. Uh, we're also working on low cost 25 G packaging, which is also very challenging. Um, again, if you have an unlimited budget, many things are easy to do. But once you have a budget of either power consumption, size, or cost, it makes the problem I think that much harder. Uh, and we're also working on low power 25G um, integrated circuits, both internally and in partnership. Um, so then what's the next step after that? So as I already said, you can get to 400G by just 16 channels of 25G, and that's kind of within our sites now. You can see how to get there. Um, if you want to go up to, to higher bandwidth density, an obvious choice would just be to have more channels, to have 32 channels. But at some point, it gets to be unwieldy, aligning all those channels, routing all those channels, and that fiber is very expensive, actually. So another path you could choose is to go even higher data rate. And I used to think, of course, since there was a debate of 25G, which you couldn't do, I didn't think we would have another direct pixels. Uh, but I'll show you this data here, which was done um, by collaboration between IBM and Finistar. We have actually um, demonstrated an error 355 gigabit relief over uh, seven meters of OM2 fiber room temperature only. There's the reference here. It was from the IEEE Photonics Conference last year. So I don't think we're going to be making a product anytime soon at 55G. But what this says is, you know, it's possible potentially to get very short reaches at higher data rates directly modulated out of pixels than probably previously thought. So I think we will see more work in this area and we should be interested to collaborate with anybody who's doing work. And then the pixel of getting short range side, there's other paths to bandwidth density. As I said, you can go higher channels, you can go multi wavelengths. But again, at, at, when you start having more and more channels, that's basically to be a little unwieldy. Uh, so there is some work both within Finistar and in the greater industry on multi core, multi node fibers, so many cores. Um, for single mode, I think it's 
far away. Uh, for multimode, I think whether it's uh, economically advantageous or not, there's a lot of interest in that going on there, so we're interested in that. Uh, when, if you want to go beyond a few meters, greater than 25G, uh, you probably got to do something different. And what people are looking at is sort of higher order modulation or multi level signal encoding using directly modulated lasers. People are looking at um, in pixels, electro optic loss or polarization modulation. And at some point, you might just say, well, you know, I can't go directly modulated. If I truly need 100 meters or 300 meters, that's as well as I can do, and I have to start going to modulate. And if you start going to modulators, you can look at ways to implement that in the gallon Marshland pixel, or you can also look at silicon or even phosphide modulator. So these are areas we're looking at for high family density connections inside of the data center. So to change, uh, change directions of two a little further, the next one I want to talk to you about was um, a little bit longer distances. When you have to go more than one, you know, 100 meters, say 10 kilometers for a route for a long length inside a data center. Uh, this is a product we're shipping today for that market. This form factor is called the CFP, C is for 100. Uh, the, the way that this is implemented is actually 10 lanes of 10 gigabit per second electrical comes in. You mux it up with the mux IC here um, that's inside the module. And then we put that information on four different wavelengths that in this case are cooled into PMLs. Uh, they get optically locked down a single fiber, and that's how what you have to do to transmit 100 gigs just 10 kilometers. So it's much um, simpler than coherent communication, much cheaper, lower power than that, but it's just significantly more uh, complexity just so that at a distance. Um, so in order to be able to do that, some of the technology that we in the industry have developed to be able to do that is co-packaging the 25G EMLs and modulator drivers in a single box package. On the receive side, we made quad 25G amplifiers. We made quad 25G uh, in box side pins. We've integrated them together in a box with an optical DMOX. And in the end, you can show good performance to all of that. So we are shipping this uh, in the industry in production today. So what do you have to do next to increase family density of these longer, but still what we call client-side data comp? So the first thing we're working on in the industry is, um, is higher-speed direct modulation. Again, the, the thing that we found is that if you can use directly modulated lasers in general, it's going to be lower power and lower cost than using external modulation. So we've been working on directly modulated lasers. In this case, this is our 25G DFP. Um, it's over uh, 10 kilometers of fiber. It's a cool laser. Uh, this both decreases our cost and our power consumption, and we'll see that in production this calendar year. Um, and then what do you need to do? Well, the next thing we need to do is, again, as I mentioned, increase that bandwidth density. So today, that box I showed you is bigger than an iPhone. You can only fit about four in a 14-inch blade for our customers. Many of them are using less than four today. So an aggregate bandwidth of 400 gigabits per second. So to increase that for them, the next thing we need to do is decrease the size again. But to decrease the size, i got to decrease the number of pins, and i got to decrease the power consumption. So one thing that has to happen is that MUX chip has to come up. So the customers now have to feed us 25G I.O. So all of a sudden you start to see 25G from the mainstream I.O., which is very, very challenging, actually. Uh, also, I can't fit four of those TOSIS in there anymore, so now I have to integrate them. And I can do that by placing discrete chips. I can do that by making integrated chips. You can do that in silicon tonic, silicon modulators. But you have to have four different wavelengths in one box with an optical MUX which is, again, very challenging. And then you have to work on low-power integrated circuits. And that'll get you to 800 gig on one grid. If you want to go yet again a factor of two, which people are already asking us for and pushing us for, you can um, <coughs> decrease, again, you need to decrease the power of that directly modulated laser, which is very challenging, probably going to need in different structures than before. And you need to make a big decrease that's also an integrated circuit technology, which is more possible uh, by just advanced, going to advanced processes. But what you see there is a cap of 400G, 800G, 1.6 tera, 3.2 tera on the part. Okay, but every optical element is still just 100G. All right, so what's next? Well, the IEEE is already talking about the 400G standard. So Ethernet has decided that it's going to forego its factors of 10 and start going factors of 4. So 400G, again, on the short reach side, will be 16 by 25. For the first generation here, 
Uh, it's a discussion also of 16 by 25. So for me, I don't really have to define anything or design anything new. Our customers will use four of these and connect them to one Mac chip, and there'll be no changes at the PMD level. Uh, but that only that really is a little unsatisfying because if you look at it, it's really no higher density than the hydrogen. So why would you do that? Uh, so what our customers and people have told us is, and what we figured out ourselves is that we, the only way to do that is to increase the signal and rates of frequency, which becomes 56G if you want to have the overhead. So there's discussions now in the IEEE of how to do that. Maybe eight wavelengths of 50G, 50 gigabits per second, or maybe four wavelengths with some sort of some sort of higher order modulation. So we have started a 56G IO uh, in the OIF on um, Finistar has. The project started last year, last year proposed was this year, because we're going to file it at the end of the year. Um, so what you see is where essentially I'll summarize here, we should be evolving at 10G. You're starting to see the emergence of all these 25G, but 56G is not so far in the future. Uh, today, all of it is built around directly modulated pixels and DFEs, but going forward, the paths are higher number of channels and more parallelism, more wavelengths, more WDM. I didn't say it, but even in shortwave, we're starting to look at shortwave WDM, and some of the industry is shortwave multimode, which is extremely challenging from the packaging perspective. Migration to 56G line rate and potential use of things that you kind of associate with transport, but in the client domain now. Um, and then just throw out one of my academic colleagues here is that after 400G, the next step is to be one terabit per second. And on the pixel side, you can kind of see a little bit arrays, multiple fiber, lots of things you might be able to do. But on the long reach side, even to just go 10 kilometers, we see no technology today that's available at a commercially viable power size performance cost. So I think that's an excellent opportunity for academic research. Because I think it's about this big, which means it's 24 watts maximum and it's got a cost of less than 15K. So that's uh, plenty of constraints to add on top of just the hard technology. Uh, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, so, so thanks for a great overview. And then, you know, you indicated already that, you know, beyond 400G, you know, data rate, you have to move to 50 k But can you detail a little bit more about the, you know, the, the biggest component yeah, I think just actually, honestly, just just from an applications perspective, how much trouble we had with actually our customers just moving from up to 10 G actually. I think that really was 25 G and 50 G is going to be tough from their that's the first step. It's not the only step, but from their routing perspective, they're used to driving very long signals on uh, PC boards that are not very expensive, having multiple connectors, and managing that. I think it's going to put a lot of constraints on the system houses that they're not used to. So that's first. But then inside of our module, probably the biggest step is, again, if you could, it is going to be, obviously you can make 50 gig modulators. People have demonstrated 50 gig modulators. But to make that at a sort of what I would call commercially viable cost, have enough optical power out of those parts, and of course you're going to have to mux them, so you're going to have optical mux losses, so the optical power is not insignificant, is actually going to be a big challenge, I think. Um, and to do it in a way that's um, economically viable um, and meets the power consumption of the sizes that people want to get to. That'll be a challenge. Uh, migrating those integrated circuits to 50G is just a matter of money and it's hard. I mean, maybe you have to take a couple iterations to get there, but the processes exist to do those chips. So I think the biggest thing will be the migration for our customers to 56G IO. And then from our side, it would actually be getting that optical source at 50G at the right price point, power consumption, and optical power output. What is the barrier from a commercially available point of view for adapting uh, higher order modulation formats relying on DSG modulation? Yeah. Is it the footprint? Is it the power consumption? Is it better to go high lines? This is a good question. I think from a commercial perspective, it's actually just the adoption of anything new. That is, if it can be done with, uh, with something that people are familiar with, an eye diagram that they're used to looking at, um, it will be done that way. So for instance, in something like Fiber Channel, which is used for storage area relief, anything that makes their part cost more money, we'll just give them a spec capture. So if we can show them, you know, some number of directly modulated meters, they might just decrease the distance just 
constrain the distance to do it. Well, after you get over that barrier of if you come to, you do have to do something more complex, then the next thing becomes power consumption. You know, again, the biggest slots we have can be 24 watts, but you know, people don't like that. And so generally, we're in a constrained environment of 12 watts. And that's to cool the part, you know, to um, all the other electronics we need to do. So maybe you get a couple watts in that DSP. So you have to really look at something that's very different than what's being done on the transport side. And I think it's actually a very interesting area of research, but there isn't, I haven't seen a lot in that direction. So uh, uh, people are talking about the most experimental and active. So what do you think about that? Because uh, it's a bit to long length and four length. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, from my perspective, so we also, uh, as I mentioned, we design some of our own integrated circuits. So we design integrated circuits with Fabulous Design House, um, and then we also design optics. So we know a lot about both. Um, my take is that. Um, I think they're going to, personally, I think it's going to stay discrete, or I shouldn't say discrete, but hybrid integration for a long time. Uh, the main reason for that is the processes that you want to use for those switch chips, they're very expensive. They're very small features. That could be like a $3 million thing, right? The silicon photon processes, the, the, the scales are big, the sizes of those weight guides are big. Uh, today, they exist in processes more like 90 nanometer, I think ST micro is not so. Uh, I don't know, 65 nanometer. So you have to migrate the processes to that other process, which costs many, many millions of dollars for a part that doesn't need that. So I think what you'll see the focus on actually more is on hybrid integration and on getting low parasitics and complete reliability for that hybrid integration. I'm not saying it will never happen, but I just don't see it anywhere in the next few years from an economically viable perspective. Yeah. I think it's, it's neat, and you'll see a lot of papers on it and things, but in terms of you know, the cost to take off those chips and transport those processes. I just think the barriers the barriers still too large. Okay, let's allow one more to ask quick so we can go back. But this is the display to talk to this generic and road question. Okay. Um this or this is real now is there a world wide for the uh I think you can see what you see yeah. um say hi uh a whole factor how you can kill it say hi to this. So we don't, there's, there's only a limited amount of published data on that, but the limited amount says it pretty much is very similar to the safety score. The density is similar, I think mean, the widths have been published, but at least there's few graphs with the widths on it. It's a little bit narrower, but the pitch from module to module is the same. And the target is, again, there's a short reach target, a 10 kilometer target, and some other targets. So we believe it's mostly like CFP2. Now, um, I believe Cisco has committed to uh, participate in the Ethernet Alliance interop at OFC 2013, and FinSearch also participated in CP2, so we, and many vendors are. So you'll see that at OFC. But from what we understand, it's very similar to CP2. Yeah. Okay, as you did, we thank Julie for this exciting thank you. presentation. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so now I would fit in different roles today. So now I would like to talk about optical uh, cognitive networks. And uh, cognition is something that we study already in the Guide of Communications Community. So we're getting a lot of inspiration, but also learning from that community to use the knowledge there in a different way and also to respond to different challenges we are having in optical communications. So I would like to acknowledge the contribution from my team members who are working in this activity, Antonio Caballero, Silvia Sandania, Tobe Kolkowski, and Arthur Silva. They belong to my group, the Metro Access and Chambers Communications. Also, I would like to give due merit to the support, sponsorship from the European Commission uh, in the framework of the Cognitive Technology News the Configure of the Network Project from which I am the PR. So, uh, I would like to start by uh, this presentation by giving a, a short overview of what we call the digital family of networking. Um, I would say that around 2010 we saw the, the commercialization of optical computer receivers accepting 
operators and vendors embracing the digital signal processing in conjunction with computer uh, receivers. So at the same time, uh, this is already going on, and there are many uh, very often press releases of, of vendors and, and telephone operators adopting this technology. And uh, there is also activities going on even further on trying to exploit uh, the advantages and the uh, advances in what is called software-defined optics uh, to come up with concepts like flexible transponder that can be reconfigured in the levels of the modulation, but also in the bit rate, and also able to allocate them flexible in the uh, spectrum domain. So, uh, actually, it's special or interesting to be an example uh, I mentioned the activities going on in software-defined network because there's a lot of work that's been originated from here. Uh, this is kind of a structure where there is an effort in trying to separate the control and the data formatting to try to simplify the network operation and trying to master the complexity of the networks. And we also see work already on demonstration on transport of SDN, fine case and components like Infidera. So it's in this trend, in this evolution, everything uh, uh, focus try to to master the complexity of optical networks. When we see the, the place, the role of cognition in optical networking. So uh, we believe that cognition can be one of those uh, elements that will benefit, that will actually enable the vision that we would like to master the complexity of the network and then have interfaces perhaps easier just to, to, to tell, I want this light bus, or I want this service in this quality of, of, of these requirements, and then something cognitive will master for you, the, the, for instance, the, the neighboring side. And I will focus now on what we are doing, and it's basically on the performance monitoring. So, so those uh, enable techniques that can tell the control of the upper layers, what is going on. So, so provide this global overview from the performance of the lens itself. So one step back, so what motivated us to look at this problem of cognition is actually the heterogeneity, which is uh, now becoming uh, apparent in optical networking as we try to introduce <coughs> new uh, technology that coherent in uh, different modulation rates, and uh, different modulation formats, data rates, and also accepting the idea of starting to play around with the uh, dynamicity of, of, of establishing wavelengths and switching paths. So, uh, and also uh, services are evolving, so uh, there is focus also on services requiring uh, different quality of transmission like latency for, for certain transactions and, and so on, or high quality uh, video conferences and so forth. So one of the, the, the ideas in the community of optical networking has been is, okay, how do we actually realize the network that can set adapt and set optimize? And this is the, the main goal of the Chrome project start to start uh, coming up, uh, considering, realizing, demonstrating techniques that allows the vision of autonomous control and management. So uh, the main idea is uh, to realize concepts of the network that can perceive the conditions, can plan, decide, act, and in doing this, we have an end-to-end -end goal to optimize, and then we learn from those adaptations. The next time, this new request to can actually make decisions faster and more accurate, and also in a way that can allow uh, learning and automatize uh, decision making. So this is actually uh, where we come into, into the game. So in order to do this, we need to know uh, the quality of transmission in the lens. And it turns out it's um, that actually it's not a simple answer, uh, and I will come back to that to know with a new light pass that is implemented by using community detection, if I put into a lens to buy or make a study of the neighbors or the neighbors will disturb the channel. And that's when we already start to notice the benefits and conditions. So but how to do this from the control plane? So in the ground project this is the architecture that has been uh, adopted and all the partners are working with their lives on this is implementing uh, the monitoring part, which is actually playing the role of the observation, and then there is the, the learning mechanism, which is implemented by uh, establishing a specific knowledge databases, but also learning modules. And from here, we are adopting processes and mechanisms from machine learning, and there's going to be another presentation. 
by my colleague, Dr. Sivan, who is explain more about this. And also, we are taking a one step further on trying to implement community processes to kind of help it in oriented and deciding. And I will present one example of those. So, all this is actually uh, trying to come up with uh, an architecture that implements what we call, or what people call it, the uh, wireless communication. So, in communities and networking in general, the community group. So observation and, and learning uh, and planning uh, mechanisms. And so now we're a bit about the monitoring. So let's try to look at this picture, which is a very simplified uh, kind of abstraction of the <coughs> web individual multiplexing system, in this case from different channels, and trying to represent by uh, colors and, and the change that they can have a different bit rate, a different multiplexing format. And all the day we can have fibers, amplified different times, we can have filtering states. And it goes out that if I, if I want to put uh, another channel or change from one modulation format to another, it's not easy to answer the question will the quality of this pass be enough to survive the length, or, or will maybe the neighbors will not like this, or the neighbors actually will invent this, 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 this new channel. And it's because it's large. Um, range of different parameters that you will need to know or measure, like you know the fiber types and lengths of the amplifiers, the neighboring channels, characteristic of the drums and so forth. So that's what we're trying to look at the impairments from the transmitter side, the side and the silver side. And with the adoption of community detection and, and digital signal processing, so they allow us to actually do this in the DSP domain. So uh, in my group, so we have been developing techniques uh, based on DSP for chromatic dispersion, uh, estimation, and monitoring. Also, demonstrating experimentally that you can estimate the quality of transmission uh, better or fast before you establish it by actually introducing place based reasoning techniques. Another important uh, aspect, if we like to accept the idea of having a global view of the network, is actually trying to already monitor what's going on by observing the constellation and perhaps uh, not needing to do the full demodulation before you know that something is going wrong. Going wrong. So we are adapting methods of uh, clustering and expectation maximization. And if we go even further and accept that we will have this flexible transponder and, 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 and software defined optics where we can have uh, uh, adaptabil adaptability to modulation formats, it would be nice to recognize one modulation format is, 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 is being sent or received automatically. So we are developing modules for automatic modulation format recognition in this type of space. So those are in the literature. And I want, I want to, with the remaining of my time to give a global view of, of some of the techniques being implemented. So uh, this is why I'm going to use it for uh, uh, showing uh, something that many of you are familiar with, the typical coherent series. So Signal and you have the front end, and then after the sample, you will implement the algorithms. So, one of the, the um, techniques that we have been trying to uh, implement to see the benefits and see how, how can it be used as a way to tell more information to the control plane and making the cognitive when we take decisions is a question of if I want to establish a new pass, will the quality of transmission be sufficient? So, uh, we adopted some techniques called case by case. <coughs> and what we do is, is we would like pass requests. We're trying to look into this knowledge database for cases that resemble that something that we perhaps established in the past that looks like the same type of request. We can uh, test this case, and uh, if it is actually a good case, it goes into the, into the database as a good case. So, uh, we are an experimental group, so we try to validate this type of ideas uh, by measurements or by uh, experiments. So here we implement a simple setup and we have uh, five channels and we have the standard IMQ modulation so we can have the uh, advanced modulation formats and um, polarization uh, multiplexing which is a common technique to double the capacity and actually many of the systems being deployed to use polarization multiplexing. We have a number of uh, five spans quite characteristic of what you would find in the Transmission, 80 kilometers of compensation in the optical domain for the dispersion, and then a computer series. So, by switching on and off uh, 
we can have different sets of, of light paths going on there, and also by changing the modulation format, we can also be different. And we can build actually, and because we have developed the, the monitoring algorithms, we can actually focus on one method. In this case, we went for the airway magnitude, and this has some other details. But you know, the, the sample comes here. So if you actually implement something very basic, the majority of case decision, so it actually works very well if you have very good channel and a very bad channel. But in between, we see that it performs very bad. So, so here, you want to, to classify this pass in advance, actually it makes a very bad job. So what the platform says, if we implement this case-based reasoning, actually we make a faster job, with a more accurate, accuracy classification of the pass before the actual strategy. And what the price of this usually is on the complexity. So in this case, it turns out that this is it's not as complex as we, if we uh, expect in terms of the size of the database. So, so this one of the cases we actually have of 80% of uh, good classifications. We, if we set this threshold around 90, which is kind of the standard EPM measure to know if the path is a good quality or not. So this is already an example where we can actually, if something is going on in, in, in the network, we want to start a new path and actually use this in. in and hopefully be automatized. Another example that I mentioned is, okay, can we observe the constellation of these modulation formats and already try to say something that was going on there, actually optimize the performance of the system. And one of those methods is trying to uh, use the, the signal processing algorithms called clustering and expectation maximization. And by doing that, we already uh, are able to observe and already Say something about the network itself going into the full modulation. And another example of that is the issue of non-linearity. So usually you have some kind of channels, but you would like to get a lot of power if you want to increase the optimal signal modulation, which actually is something that is needed for higher modulation format. But as you start pumping any more power, then non-linearity is become in. But when when do you actually know that? Nonlinearity is actually affecting the channel. So the idea behind this type of work is can we observe the, the, the constellation and really tell what is going on. So there are three cases here. It's actually a mesh data. So here this is close to the case of the linear channel, so dominated by the gas and white gas and noise. And if we look at the covariant analysis, we see the only the diagonal uh, has a value which is not to zero, so the cross correlations. So we see the kind of round well. Gaussian dominated noise. But if there are no linearity side, for instance, for non linear noise, you see that the shape of the process are different. And also the decision pattern, if you were about to compute, they start to have a screw shape, so they are not uh, straight lines or, or linear decisions. And here, for instance, is the case of phase noise. So just by, by looking at this type of observing the constellations, uh, Making computations with covariance, and we can already say, ah, uh, here is something no linear going on. So, by establishing these feedback loops and telling the, the control plane, we can take over the decisions on, 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 on take one of the channels off or lower the power or go to another modulation format. So, this is the idea behind it. And this is possible now because of the, uh, the advantages of having <coughs> in optical communications. So, the so the resource, um, because I want to move, so I uh, don't shift too much the uh, time slot. I want to say that we have proved both in simulations and experiments that this is actually the case. So we can actually uh, make improvements in the performance of the leaks by adopting these methods. The other one is the modulation format recognition, so it will be very interesting. Uh, some ideas date back to Digital communications and wireless communication, and here we adopted in the optical domain. So we got inspired by some work presented in OFC last year from Agilent. We actually were trying to use the stocks domain for optimization of coherent receivers. So we went further and found out that this can be done actually for the modulation detection, and this can be done before all the integrity of the demodulation takes place. And it's independent of, of the knowledge for um, polarization mixing and character frequency offset, which is actually quite good. So we emulated this, and um, the idea behind it is if you look at the slot space, each modulation form has a very distinctive pattern and clustering. 
So if you know that, then you are able to make test hypothesis tests, and you see clearly that the, the, the modulation format that is supposed to be there will win the hypothesis test very, very, very remarkably. So we went into the lab. Again, this is one of our kind of lines of work, emulate and simulate and respond, and then prove it in the laboratory. And for this case, we use QPSK and CCQM, and once again, it proves that we can actually distinct very clearly which modulation format is there. So with this, I would like to say that the development of optical communications into more accessible, more digital transceivers, transponders, is actually opening new research possibilities for, for instance, uh, enabled coordination of optical networks. And we also believe that there are other goals that can be achieved in the optimization of optical networks by using cognitive techniques, like, for instance, the end to end energy consumption. So, with this, I would like to thank you. I think that I will take the questions in the debate because I would like to invite now our next speaker, which is Dr. Fred Kish from India, who is going to talk on the circuit for next generation of the I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting us here to talk today and some of our uh, work at Infinera. And specifically, I'm going to, going to talk about uh, any phosphide based large scale photonic integrated circuits uh, utilized in uh, high capacity and next generation networks. Um, the, if you look at the network, it uh, uh, basically can consist to go all the way from the submarine, long haul, all the way to the metro, and eventually uh, short reach client and uh, chip to chip. What we focus at Infinera is from metro core to summary. So what I'm going to talk about today are uh, technologies and networks that are applicable to this part of the market space. Specifically, we primarily focus around the long haul. And if you look, um, uh, like uh, Julie uh, Amy talked previously, uh, one of the uh, unique requirements is you have to solve simultaneously multiple constraints. And this really makes uh, for challenging solutions. And specifically, uh, we need to uh, worry about performance and reach. In the long haul, we reach as a few thousand kilometers. Um, we worry about capacity for chip or capacity for line card because this goes to uh, both capital and operational expense. Um, power dissipation is very important. We have a fixed size footprint and a fixed size power that we can uh, consume. Uh, and all of this has to be deployed uh, in systems that are capable of 20 years reliability. In 2004, we introduced the first large scale photonic integrated circuits. Uh, in long haul network products. These consisted of uh, 200 gigabit uh, picks, one a transmitter pick, and one a receiver pick. Uh, the transmitter pick consisted of 10 channels. Uh, each channel operated at 10 gigabits with a tunable distributed feedback laser, an external electroabsorption modulator, um, variable optical attenuator. Um, monitor photodiodes, and then all of the, each of these 10 channels multiplexed into an array waveguide. And then on the receive side, we had a array waveguide demultiplexer and 10 high-speed photodetectors. Uh, this gave us a capacity, this is an example of a chassis. At Infinera, we actually built complete network solutions. Uh, and the, uh, this, the, this product has a capacity of 100 gigabits per slot. Uh, and has a integrated switch, and this is really enabled by some of the advantages of photonic integration, and I'll talk about that 
later. Um, this has been a very successful product. Um, today we've deployed over 9,500 nodes with over 100 different customers. Um, and uh, on a reliability basis, we have over 859 million field hours without a single failure. So if you, what this uh, plot shows is uh, the data capacity for chip as it's evolved uh, in the, in the uh, telecommunications network. And what you see as a, uh, as a function of time is that this scaling first occurred by simply scaling the uh, data rate uh, discrete components. And then we see that we introduced uh, integration uh, to uh, go uh, not only from two and a half to ten gigabits per second. Uh, and in Venera, we continue to scale thanks to the amplified integrated circuits. And this requires both concurrent serial, uh, so along the full channel, as well as parallel integrations on multiple channels <coughs> on a single chip. Um, what I'm going to focus on for the majority of the rest of the talk is. Uh, next, uh, current and next generation products that we just released. Uh, and these are 500 gigabit per second uh, photonic integrated circuits based upon coherent communication, specifically polarization multiplex QPSK. Um, and this is a step function increase in both the integration level as well as the diversity of elements that we've integrated on the chips. As I said previously, the uh, continued progression of data capacity uh, in the network uh, resulted from increasing the uh, amounts of integration. And what you see is that the industry has been integrating more and more elements um, as a function of time. Um, at Infinero, we introduced a step function increase in that integration rate, and this resulted in the first large scale photonic integrated circuits where now the first device has integrated 50 or 60 uh, functions per chip. Um, and the current devices now are over 450 functions integrated onto a single chip. Um, one commentary is this is actually not a fit to the data, but the same slope as uh, the scaling of circuit scaling for silicon integrated circuits. So this is uh, about uh, 100x slower than Moore's law, uh, but it's consistent uh, with uh, what we think is the appropriate scaling for photonic integrated circuits, which I use as 10x over Moore's law. It's about 100x per decade. Um, and if you, the reason that we think that the circuit scaling is the more appropriate metric is because the photonic integrated circuits, what we're integrating are not simple on off switches, but we're integrating things like local oscillators or multiplexers. These types, of fun these types of elements have a functionality that's equivalent to more of a circuit functionality than a single building block functionality. So that's why we think that's the appropriate scaling rate uh, to, to look at and how we should scale in the future. Uh, this is a schematic of a 500 gigabit uh, transmitter. Um, what you see is there's uh, 10 distributed feedback lasers. Um, these all then uh, uh, feed a set of polarization multiplex uh, QPSK modulators, and uh, uh, we split the light into uh, two different uh, branches. One we call a TE branch, and another is a TM to B, um, and we multiplex each different branch into an array waveguide, and then off chip we rotate and combine. Uh, there's 450 different functions integrated onto this chip. Uh, eight different types of optical functions, includes a tunable distributed feedback laser, uh, mock center modulator, phase adjusters, variable optical attenuators. This gives you a little bit more idea of what these uh, coherent phase modulator uh, consists of. For each lambda, uh, we not only uh, have uh, both an in phase and quadrature uh, modulator, these are mock center phase modulators. And there's high speed as well as control uh, functions within the modulator. This is the same as you would find in a lithium iodine modulator, uh, all implemented in indium phosphide. This is a picture of the active block of the chip. I haven't shown the multiplexers here just uh, for reasons of space. Uh, but the main thing that I want you to take away from 
this picture is, this is an integrated circuit. It just happens to be a photonic integrated circuit. Um, and with that comes with the complexity uh, that it takes to design and manufacture uh, integrated circuits. So for example, uh, the number of mass levels to uh, make this device is similar to what you might have on 90 or 130 nanometer C blocks. Uh, the receiver uh, is a polarization multiplex QPSK receiver. Uh, the architecture shown here. Um, this, we have two polarizations uh, that come in. Uh, these that uh, come feed a single AWG from two different ends of the AWG. Uh, we demultiplex the light, mix it with a local oscillator through an optical hybrid, and that feeds a series of uh, balanced floating detectors. Ultimately, this then is amplified by uh, trace and heat amplifier and feeds the digital signal processing electronics. This uh, device has over 150 integrated functions of seven different types. In addition to developing the chips, we spend a lot of time worrying about how do we uh, package and interconnect these devices. Um, this shows you a uh, image where uh, we're actually interconnecting the transmitter pick uh, to the subassembly here. Uh, and what you literally see is five layers of stacked wire box. Um, and this is, at least as far as we are aware, uh, the highest density of electrical interconnect for either electric, electronic or optical ICs. Um, the devices are all packaged in hermetic uh, LGA packages, uh, either stacked ceramic, the packages have an IO capability of greater than 1,000. You see the transmitter on the left and the receiver on the right. Uh, there's over 24 feet of wire box uh, in these packages. Uh, each package is fed by dual polarization maintaining fibers. Um, we, uh, on the transmitter, have an integrated silicon germanium box under modulator driver array to drive the uh, phase modulators. And we have a 40 channel silicon germanium uh, transit feed, feed amplifier array. These not now run about 14 feet wide. Uh, this just shows some exemplary data of the transmitter. You see, uh, these, are, these are the LI curves for all 10 lasers. Uh, different than OOK in uh, coherent systems, you need to worry about phase noise. So, what that translates down to is managing the line width of the laser. So, this shows the uh, uh, power spectral density, the phase noise spectrum uh, of all 10. Uh, Laser to you see that not with a line with better than one megahertz. Uh, and that results in uh, no penalty from optical performance capability at 3,000 kilometers. Um, these are the extinction curves for the box under modulators. Remember, because we have nested in polarization multiplex box under modulators, we actually have 40 of these on the chip. Um, and actually, what this is is all 40 curves overlaying on top of each other. So that just gives you some idea of the manufacturability of these uh, devices. And then again, you have all 10 channels from the transmitter. Uh, one of the things that people have talked about in, as a concern about uh, indium phosphide photonic integrated circuits is can you scale? Can you make these large scale photonic integrated circuits? Um, and that's one of the things that we've been very focused at in Infinera. Uh, one of the keys is uh, making sure that we can actually just have all elements function. Um, and so what this shows is, and the key to that is having very low killer defect density. And so what this shows is killer defect density is a function of time. This is what silicon ICs have done, and this is what we've done for 100 gigabit picks, and these are early data on 500 gigabit picks. And what you see is our killer defect density is about what silicon was circa early 1990s. So what does that mean? You can translate that into functional yield. And so, if you take that uh, killer defect density of about one half per square centimeter, you see that if I'm going to integrate about 450 functions like we have on our transmitter, you've got about 70% functional yield. So, uh, and as we continue to do drive down the manufacturing learning curve, we expect that that is going to improve over time. And so, what does that mean? It means that I can continue to scale my photonic integrated circuits over time, and that it's very viable with high yields to get to a thousand or multiple thousand elements 
as we look towards the next three to five years. Um, we monetize this technology. We ship the first systems based upon this at the end of Q2 2012. Um, these systems, this is a chassis for one of the systems, the characteristic, key characteristics, these are 500 gigabits on a single line card. Um, the, each chassis is capable of 5 terabits. Um, as a result of the reduced footprint and power dissipation uh, and cost of these modules, we're able to integrate an uh, OTM switch. So uh, previously, uh, Julie talked about having the ability to have a whole bunch of interfaces coming in on the switch. We've integrated that into the transport system here. Um, and this one of the keys, and this is really enabled by the photonic integrated circuits and the footprint on them, is that this is a non-blocking switch. And so we have five terabits of non-blocking switching capability. And I'll talk about why that really provides superior economics and that's enabled by these large scale photonic integrated circuits. Ultimately, uh, we wind up using 50% less power <coughs> on the network level and 33% less space. Um, and what you see here is the I diagrams so all 10 channels. This is 1,700 kilometers to your full transmission. So why, why is it important to have an integrated switch um, in these uh, high-capacity transmission products? We'll just take this simple example where I've got 6, 10 gigabit signals coming into my transport box from the west, 4, 10 gigabit from the east, and I want to all send these out down one single uh, 100 gigabit channel. Well, to do that, if I have an external switch, I've got to route six patch cables from the west, four patch cables from the east to a separate switch, switch them all into uh, a different set of patch cables, route those to the north, so I'll go down to my line side capacity. And that's just for one wavelength. So now imagine I've got an 80 or 90 wavelength uh, transport system. Uh, it really becomes manageable in everything from cost structure. I've got a lot of client optics there. Uh, I've got a whole separate switch, a whole separate footprint. Uh, so that's why the industry is moving towards integrated switching with these transport chassis. However, uh, with, if I use discrete optics, these atomic integrated circuits, I did show it, but literally, place hundreds of cool boxes. I can't fit all of that capacity in a single switch, otherwise I wind up with a very low capacity transport slash switch. So photonic integration really enables these high capacity of non-block switch uh, platforms. And what how does that translate from an economic standpoint? This nationwide network model uh, 8 terabits of uh, capacity and 50% utilization, so 4 terabits of uh, uh, falling within the network. Um, what you see uh, is that if I wind up with, even, even with an uh, integrated switch, the one that's blocking, uh, uh, I still want, uh, whereas I have a non-blocking integrated photonic uh, 500 gigabit uh, pick base solution. I reduce the number of line modules by 70%, 60% less fiber patches, 67% less chassis, and 33% less, less racks. So we wind up with significant savings, not just at the component level, but at the network level. And you can imagine this is not just capital cost, but translates to operational costs as well. The uh, advantages of the system have been very well received in the market within uh, a little bit over a quarter. We went from shipping no systems to having number one market share. So in third quarter 2012, um, we uh, deployed 38% of all long haul ports uh, shipped in the quarter. Uh, we continue to do future work on these systems and so these modules that we've developed are compatible with soft decision forward error correction. We did uh, a first uh, demonstration of that uh, in the last month. Uh, we were the first ones to do that with a 500 gigabit, you know, 500 gigabit uh, coherent super channel. Um, see, this is 4,200 kilometers from Hawaii to California. Uh, we've also worked on next generation devices. So this is a terabit uh, device, 
a terabit transmitter talking to a terabit receiver. Uh, you see that, uh, again, we've got a very good extinction ratio in the modulators uh, and uh, high bandwidth on the photo detectors that you can see uh, for 1.12 terabit transmitter to receiver back to back operation. We've got very good eyes. The constellation diagram, sorry. Um, one of the challenges, so uh, I did point this out earlier, but you can imagine one of the challenges is how we can interconnect these devices as we scale to more and more multi terabit devices. Hopefully, that was obvious from some of the video that I showed. Another challenge, uh, if you look, is how do I continue to make these devices more and more dense? Um, so, we've improved the density of functions per millimeter uh, by an order of magnitude from when we made our first 100 gigabit devices to 500 gigabit devices. But this is still about six orders of magnitude worse than the density of what the find the silicon integrated circuit. And so this is a, one of the primary challenges for when people talk about, well, why one of photonic integrated circuits going to become ubiquitous? It really is going to go to how do I really get that functional density to be uh, what do you can do with silicon? If you look today, what are we dealing with? We're dealing with single layer optical uh, 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 interconnects and electrical interconnects on these device devices. If you look here uh, in electrical ICs, there's multi, you know, you're dealing with uh, six or more levels of interconnect technology. So uh, smaller devices, with better ability to route devices, multi layers are all going to be, if you look in the longer term, interesting technologies to develop for product integrated circuits. Um, in summary, uh, we believe large scale photonic integrated circuits are transforming the network. We see this in the uh, success that we've had in 100 gigabit, uh, and now the uh, And uh, uh, we believe that the platform that we have today is actually scalable to multi terabits. Thank you very much. Okay, I see that. Some questions. A question on uh, on technology, uh, laser waveguide integration technology. What's the We don't disclose the detailed materials technology, but what we have said is that we don't uh, use anything that hasn't been, you know, we haven't invented a brand new technology here. We use technologies that other people use for integration. How are you, uh, how are you tuning the witness? You said you're tuning DFB witness. Thermal, they're thermal tuning. So each uh, DFB was independent of temperature control. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. Could you elaborate on the nature of the killer effects that we're talking about? Are they uh, introduced in the fat uh, process, or is it due to the uh, inherent qualities of even phosphide substrate? So, so the uh, so obviously the size of the defect that is relevant to the atomic integrated circuit is very different than what it is to electronic integrated circuit. Because you know, we're always sensitive to things that are about a half a micron to the wavelength of light material. Uh, the we're dominated today by process-induced defects. We're not limited yet by uh, substrate uh, defects. At the 25 So, so we look very hard at uh, electrical and optical crosstalk, and uh, uh, with just good design methodology, we've not found that to be a moving factor. So we can make that basically where we don't have any help to do the electrical or optical crosstalk from channel to channel. These are all the interfaces, but the interface is going to be all lined up. Yes, yes. Okay, I see. So, so of course, you have some, some incredible work on the integration and you know, in the phosphide, but you know, there's a big bit of momentum also for integration for products in silicon. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts about the 
So uh, you know, we're, we are agnostic to what technology is, is utilized or the lever of integration. Um, that being said, if you look in the uh, marketplace that we serve, uh, which is you know, not only the long haul and extending into the metro, performance is paramount. And uh, uh, Indian phosphide devices have superior performance to silicon. And so once you can get your yields to be sufficient, and we've published uh, elsewhere that uh, you know, our wafer fat yields are equivalent to what we get in the silicon IC fat. And we talked about the functional yield. The main part of the economics really come down to the performance yield in the phosphide is uh, you can do things that you just can't even close links with with the uh, silicon photonics. So you see that, um, at least for you know, the foreseeable future right now, and especially in the long haul, uh, that things will be dominated by the phosphide. Um, in the shorter distances, you know, so if I look at you know, chip to chip, Right. Actually, it's the exact same question. What about the new pie of the five So, in the pick diagram for the 500G, it looked like there was, was I it correct in viewing that as two DFDs per wavelength? And if they I was correct why you use two CWDFDs instead of one. So it's a dual carrier, so it is uh, two DFDs per 100 gig. And uh, right now that enables us to operate at 14 gigabyte <coughs> instead of 28 gigabyte, which really from an electronics and packaging cost structure is completely the optimal point. The devices are more than capable of going faster, and that's effectively how we're going to get to terabit. Okay. Um, I would like to represent our speaker, Dr. Fitch, for the for this exciting talk. And if there are more questions, we will have very soon a coffee break. Okay, that's it. Thank you. So now we move on with our program. And the next speaker is Ahmad Taimi, which is from here at Stanford. And he Okay, good morning everyone, and uh, thank you all for coming here. I would like on behalf of uh, PNRL um, to welcome you at Stanford. And uh, unfortunately, Professor Kozowski uh, was one of the main organizers of this workshop uh, and was not able actually to, uh, to be here. He's cruising somewhere in Europe right now. Um, so the title of the talk is basically one of the projects that we're currently working on at PNRL. Um, it's basically a new access, uh, optical access network architecture. It's called UltraFlow. Um, uh, the the uh, people that are involved are a bunch of 